recording and we okay so we are going to do non-hodgkin lymphoma and you see this uh, big lump over here that is uh, highly indicative of a lymphoma um, but um, lymphomas are basically tumors that arise in the lymph nodes and they are, that is due to the transformation of the cells that are there in the lymph node. So they are solid lymphoid malignancies that arise from malignant transformation of immune cells in the lymphoid tissue. And as I said, we have got many different types of immune cells that include B cells and T cells and macrophages and dendritic cells. But we will see that it most commonly arises from the B cells. So uh, it is a group of malignant neoplasms of the lympho lymphocytes with more than 90, 90 subtypes. Okay, So it is basically lymphocytes. And differences in histology um, has led to the classification of Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphoma that we have already done in the previous lecture. So non-Hodgkin lymphomas are tumors originating from lymphoid tissue, mainly in the lymph nodes. And these tumors result from chromosomal translocations, uh, which is one chromosome breaks and attaches to another chromosome. And I'll show that to you in a schematic diagram. Uh, infections, uh, particularly viral infections, environmental factors, immunodeficiency states, as I said, HIV AIDS or immunosuppressive therapy, then chronic inflammation and about 85% of all malignant lymphomas are NHLs, and the median age is 67 years. But some, like Burkitt lymphoma, they occur at a younger age. Uh, with respect to prognosis, it can be divided into two groups, indolent, which means so slow growing, and aggressive, which means fast growing. Uh, but uh, clinically, uh, for oncologists, the most practical way of classifying is according to their predicted clinical behavior, right? And we'll go into all those details, how we uh, predict the prognosis, what factors do we take into account when we uh, want to predict the course of the disease and the therapy that we have to choose, all right? So um, lymph node is the place where the lymphomas arise more commonly. So a quick re review of the anatomy and histology, we have efferent, uh, vessels from which the lymph comes in and it brings uh, antigens with it. And um, then uh, it, this, uh, this is the efferent from which the lymph uh, flows out. Then it has got three regions, cortex, paracortex, and medulla. In the cortex, we have got B cells and follicular dendritic cells and some macrophages. Then in the paracortex, again, we have got T cells and dendritic cells. So we have two types of dendritic cells, follicular dendritic cells, which are more related to memory of the immune system. And these dendritic cells are, as you know, antigen-presenting cells. We have three types of antigen-presenting presenting cells. One, are, one is dendritic cells, then we have macrophages and B cells as well. Then in the medulla, we have got macrophages and we have got plasma cells. And if you remember from your immunology, Plasma cells are B cells that are producing antibodies, okay? Then subcortical sinus of the lymph node and cortical sinus of the lymph nodes. And more important are these primary follicles. Primary follicles are places where the B cells are naive. They have not yet been exposed to uh, antigen. So they are at the antigen uh, independent stage of development. And when they are exposed to antigen, they start dividing. And then we call it uh, the germinal center, which is over here. We have got dividing uh, B cells over here or plasma cells or that produce antibodies. And this mantle zone are the original cells that have been pushed to one side. And then we have got high endothelial venules. When the B cells and T cells are released into the bloodstream, from the bone marrow, they come out of the blood vessels through high, high endothelial venules, okay? And here they will go either to primary follicles and undergo further development, and that is your immunology, okay? So that was a quick review of the lymph node, and this is the place 
where the lymphomas develop. Follicular lymphoma is a B cell derived lymphoma that arises in the germinal center, all right? Now, two or three slides on pathophysiology. The lymphatic system includes lymph nodes, thymus, spleen, bone marrow. I, I'm sure you already know that and mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. Um, and in the GIT, we call it gut associated lymphoid tissue. Then NHL represents a progressive clonal expansion of B cells or T cells or natural killer cells, right? In, in, uh, very, in the beginning, in, if you go back to the bone marrow, in the bone marrow, we have got those pluripotent cells that then differentiate into certain lineages and when they differentiate into white blood cell lineage, lineage, they have three lines, B cells and T cells and natural killer cells. Again, your uh, immunology, no more details, uh, but there's an accumulation of proto-oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, all right? Uh, proto-oncogenes, uh, they, if they are mutated, they become oncogenes. And oncogenes are genes um, that produce tumors, okay? If those genes are expressed or activated, they cause cancers to develop, okay? So, uh, and they occur as a result of mutations, and we call them gain-of-function mutations. Whereas tumor suppressor genes, as I explained previously as well, they are good genes. They suppress uh, tumors, okay? So if there is any mutation, these genes will be inactivated, all right? So B cell lymphomas account for 85% of all lymphomas. T cell uh, or T lymphocyte lymphomas are 15% and natural killer are very rare, okay? So oncogenes can be activated by chromosomal translocations, which is the hallmark of lymphomas. This is the most important genetic alteration that takes place in lymphomas. Then tumor suppressor genes can be inactivated by deletions or mutations. So note that uh, oncogenes are activated in all cancers and tumor suppressor genes are inactivated in all cancers. And what do I mean by deletions? As you know, that DNA is just a sequence of adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine, you know, they go on repeating and we have got billions of those in the human genome. So this is, I've shown you a short sequence. Now, what is deletion? You see over here, uh, this one nucleotide, this G guanine uh, has been deleted. It somehow, uh, it fell off, okay? So this is deletion. So what will happen is that the whole frame of transcription will shift. Uh, and we will get a very different protein or, um, I mean, the gene, that means that the gene is mutated. Uh, and uh, what do I mean by point mutation or mutation? If we look over here, this C has been replaced with an A, okay? So that is known as a mutation. The original nucleotide is substituted by some other nucleotide, okay? It is also known as single nucleotide polymorphism. Actually, it's a mutation. Uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms are sometimes normal as well. Uh, right, so NHLs are characterized by level of differentiation, the size of the cell. Okay, small cells are better than large size cells. Cells rate of proliferation, histologic growth pattern and introduction of genes by viruses, oncogenic viruses. Oncogenic viruses means those viruses that uh, produce cancers, okay? And I'll give you examples. Epstein-Barr virus is one of those viruses. Right, so in many uh, non-Hodgkin lymphomas, specific chromosomal or DNA alterations are present. They are known as cytogenetic lesions. Uh, these can be used as markers for diagnosis and subclassification of NHLs, right? So, you know, we subclassify them because we want to give uh, or, we, or we want to select a treatment regimen according to the class, but uh, uh, we have got other ways of uh, classifying them or uh, predicting the prognosis that we will see later on. 
For the B cell NHL subtypes, the following are important determinants of tumor aggressiveness, pattern of growth, cell size. I already mentioned that smaller cells <clears throat> have a better prognosis. So nodular pattern is less aggressive than diffuse pattern. Nodular pattern means there are nodules uh, uh, in, in the lymph node or uh, uh, whatever the tumor is, okay? Uh, then we have got lymphocytes, uh, lymphomas of small lymphocytes. They generally have a more indolent course than large lymphocytes. And indolent means slow growing. Large lymphomas have intermediate grade or high grade aggressiveness. So small lymphocytes are slow growing and large lymphocyte lymphomas are aggressive. They are fast growing. And treatment and prognosis depend upon the subtype. And we we'll look at it when we reach the tumor part. So uh, we said that translocations are very common and they are the hallmark of uh, lymphoma. So here, you know, I'm showing you two chromosomes. You know, we have got 23 pairs of chromosomes. 23 pair chromosomes come from the father and 23 chromosomes come from the mother. So we have a total of um, 46 chromosomes, but we have got pairs, you know, uh, chromosome number one, we have two of them, one from the father and one from the mother. So what's happening in translocation is that you have got this chromosome number 18 and you have got this chromosome number 14. So it is 14, 18 translocation. D stands for translocation. So what happens is that a part of chromosome 14 and this part is making um, the heavy chain of the antibody, all right? So this part breaks from chromosome number 14 and it will attach to chromosome number 18. Part of chromosome 14 breaks and is attached to chromosome 18. And from chromosome 14, th there is a gene which is BCL2 gene, okay? It is anti-apoptotic, you know, apoptos apoptosis is cell death, programmed cell death, which is good in cancers, okay? So this is, this prevents apoptosis, which means it's not good for cancers This if this gene is expressed, okay? If this gene is activated, it will prevent apoptosis, which is the death of the cell. So this part breaks away and it will attach to this part. So what has happened is that this IgH, which is produced in very large quantities, it broke away and the, its place was taken by this bad gene, okay? And remember that this is very highly expressed gene in, uh, in, um, in B cells because they make antibodies and this makes a part of the antibody. All right, so this is before and after. These are the normal chromosomes and these are the altered chromosome, all right? So there are many chromosomal translocations. T1418 translocation is the most common chromosomal abnormality found in non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. This translocation occurs in 85% of follicular lymphomas and 25% of higher grade lymphomas, okay? Now what happens in, as a, in this translocation, as I already explained to you, the BCL2 apoptotic inhibitor, it inhibits apoptosis. When the, when the cell becomes a cancer cell, we want it to die through apoptosis, but this gene is preventing apoptosis, okay? It is inhibiting that. So what happens that this gene breaks from chromosome 14 that I've shown you over here, and it attaches to chromosome 18, and it is expressed in very large quantities. So anti-apoptotic genes um, on chromosome 18 next to is, is translocated next to heavy chain region of immunoglobulin locus on chromosome 14. So what, what has happened is that now this gene will be uh, transcribed and then translated in very large quantities and that will inhibit apoptosis, okay? Then we have got T1114 translocation uh, that has diagnostic association with mantle cell lymphoma. I showed you the mantle region in the lymph node. Then infections, some viruses have the ability to produce cancer and they cause chronic uh, antigenic stimulation and cytokine dysregulation, uh, which lead to 
proliferation of B cells and T cells. Epstein Barr virus, it produces Burkitt's lymphoma. You know, it's a very fast growing cancer. Actually, this is the fastest growing cancer in the humans. Okay, sometimes it can double its size uh, within a week or maybe a couple of days. Uh, human T cell leukemia virus is another one, and Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus. You know, Kaposi sarcoma is common in HIV infection, and it is caused by herpes virus. Then there are certain in environmental factors. I'll just quickly go through them. They can be chemicals or chemotherapy, radiation. You know, these are the treatments for cancer. Maternal smoking, this is a moderate or modest risk factor, chronic inflammation, or Sjogren syndrome and Hashimoto thyroiditis. So they can uh, predispose a person to risk of cancer. Immunodeficiency states, these are very important for producing lymphomas particularly. They could be, or uh, they can be congenital, like uh, severe combined immunodeficiency syndrome or disease, okay? They can be acquired as in HIV AIDS, or they can be induced like in immunosuppression, those patients who are getting immunosuppressive therapy. In immunodeficiency states, there is a high incidence of extra nodal involvement and aggressiveness. So we said that lymphoma is basically a disease of lymph nodes. Extra nodal means it has gone out of the lymph nodes, maybe in the adjacent tissue or uh, maybe somewhere else, okay? Celiac disease has also been associated with lymphomas. Uh, now, this is for your reference only, so I will not read this one. You have to read it on your own. It just tells you that uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma is the seventh most common cancer, okay? And these are the status, statistics from the USA. There were about 80,000 cases or whatever in certain years. All right, so prognosis, uh, the prognosis is good. You know, the five-year survival rate is about 73%. And the survival rate has improved over the years. And there are uh, reasons for that because the medical care has improved, you know, improvement in medical and nursing care. Then we have got new drugs, novel therapeutic strategies, including monoclonal antibodies. And you have seen lots of them in the previous lectures as well. You have also seen CAR T cell therapy in the previous lectures, okay? Then use of biomarkers of uh, response to therapy uh, and implement implementation of tailored or personalized uh, treatment for the patients, okay? The prognostic factors include tumor histology, tumor stage, tumor bulk, which means the size of the tumor, the age of the patient, performance status, whether the patient is active or not very active, bedridden, whatever, LDH, uh, lactic dehydrogenase levels, and beta-2 microglobulin, and extranodal disease. So we have got a lot of these factors. You can take um, them into account when you decide your treatment or when you are trying to predict the prognosis or the overall survival of the patient or five-year survival of the patient, right? But we have got other systems as well. And one of them is International Prognostic Index, okay? You have got these International Prognostic Indices for uh, many cancers and many other diseases as well. Mm -hmm. We saw that we have this in uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia as well. So the prognostic factors given in the previous slide are predictors of invasive potential of the cancer, response to treatment, tolerance to intensive therapy, performance status, age. Bone marrow involvement is important. You know, when whenever there is bone marrow involvement, the prognosis is bad, okay? Then we have this International Prognostic Index, IPI. It is used to identify patients at high risk of relapse. So you give the treatment and the disease, disease comes back, that is what relapse is. Or it, is, uh, it can uh, predict overall survival. OS stands for overall survival of the patient, right? How long the patient is going to live. And it is based on spe specific sites like bone marrow, sinus, liver, testes, okay? 
And we have got five risk factors according to this international prognostic index. So one is age above 60 years and we give one point for age. So if the patient with lymphoma comes to you and he's above 60, give him one point. If he's below 60, then a zero. Uh, and arbor stage, which I'll show you later on, if the patient is stage three or four, give him one point. Extra sites, more than one, one point. One or less or no involvement, zero point. LDH level, if it is elevated, one point, not elevated, zero. Performance status grades that we have seen previously, okay? Uh, so there is one EPOC performance status and Karnofsky performance status that we have done previously. So if it is grade two to four, you give him one point. If it is grade one, then give him zero points, okay? So based on this, uh, we can calculate the five-year survival uh, and also overall survival. So if you if the patient has got zero or one points, then the chances of survival at five years are 75%, which is good. If the score is two or three, then the chance is 50% at five years. And if it is four or five, then the chance becomes 25%, all right? So prognosis, uh, we have got a flippy score as well. Okay, follicular lymphoma. For patients uh, with follicular lymphoma, the second most common subtype, the most common is aggressive lymphomas. The FLIPI score is calculated on five adverse prognostic factors. And again, you see age above 60, same classification three and four, number of nodal sites, LDH elevated, hemoglobin, okay? And if you look at this, all are the same, except for hemoglobin. We don't have hemoglobin over here, and we don't have performance status in this one. So in FLIPI score, which is Follicular Lymphoma International prognostic index, we take into account the hemoglobin level. If it is less than one, we give one point, all right? And again, then same, almost the same, except that intermediate risk is um, two points, the two factor, here it is two to three, all right? And poor risk is three or more. So almost uh, the same. Other prognostic factors are biomarkers like BCL2 or BCL6 proteins. We have got lab tests to identify them, uh, and uh, cDNA, microarray, complementary DNA, uh, then congenital or acquired AIDS, that means poor response to treatment. Time to achieve complete remission. If the patient achieves a complete remission by the third cycle of chemotherapy, then the prognosis is good. But if he doesn't achieve that, then the prognosis is a poor, so third cycle of chemotherapy. We usually give six cycles or eight cycles. Then immunophenotype, uh, aggressive T or NK lymphomas have worse prognosis than B cells, but as you saw that 85% of lymphomas are B cell lymphomas, right? T cells, particularly NK lymphomas are rare, okay? Cytogenetic abnormalities, oncogene expression, you can check for them. Okay, we have seen this as well in previous lectures. Now, clinical presentation, um, uh, cl clinical manifestation depends upon the location of lymphomatous process, okay? And the rate of growth of the tumor and the function of the organ that might be compromised because of the size of the tumor or the presence of the tumor nearby, okay? So we have got low-grade lymphomas, we have, we have got high-grade lymphomas. If the the low-grade lymphomas, they uh, present with peripheral neuropathies and they are painless, okay? B symptoms are not present. I'll show you what B symptoms are. And hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, or cytopenias due to bone marrow involvement may be present, okay? Not necessarily present. Now, intermediate or high grade, they are rapidly growing. They are bulky. They are big. Depending upon what type they are, big, Either it is more than six centimeters or more than 10 centimeters uh, that I'll show you later on, okay? Then here are the B symptoms. There are three B symptoms. They are present in 30 to 40% of cases of high grade or intermediate grades. So fever, night sweats, and weight loss in six months. 
which should be more than 10%. So these are the B symptoms. And when B symptoms are present, we saw in Hodgkin lymphoma that the disease is then unfavorable. And elevated levels of serum lactate. Then we have got uh, these uh, lymphomas in gastrointestinal tract as well. And present, we will have GI symptoms like anorexia, which is loss of appetite, weight loss, nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, fullness, obstruction, perforation. So all GI symptoms will be present. And if the more symptoms, the worse the prognosis. Then CNS lymphomas, obviously the symptoms are then headache, lethargy, focal neurologic symptoms, seizures, which are uh, also known as epileptic seizures. There could be paralysis or problems in the spinal cord, okay? So the, the presence of symptoms depends upon uh, the presence uh, upon the location of the lymphomas, okay? In GI tract, CNS, or wherever. Uh, they could present with different types of symptoms, okay? And we have to do a lot of investigations that I've given you in this slide. Now, I, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'll just give you the list of these investigations. I'm not going to details of each and every investigation because that is uh, beyond the scope, scope of our lecture at this point. Uh, I have another lecture in which I've given you all the details of lab workup or investigations and also the details of all the drugs separately, right? But in this lecture, we will not go into those details, okay? So you can do a complete blood count, serum chemistries, beta-2 microglobulin, the presence of which shows poor prognosis. You can do a chest x-ray, CT scan, bone scan, gallium scan, MRI, PET. And you have seen that in all cancers, Mugus scan is something different. It looks uh, at the functioning of the heart. Particularly, it is very accurate for um, measuring the ejection fraction. Okay? You can do a biopsy, lumbar puncture, histology, immunophenotypic analysis, cytogenetic studies like translocations and staging. Okay? Now, the only thing we are going to do is staging because you should at least know something uh, about the staging. And we have seen that staging has been different in different cancers. And again, it is different in uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma as well. Uh, it is something like the same that we saw in Hodgkin lymphoma. It is known as N arbor classification, okay? So staging is important in selecting a treatment um, in, in, in selecting a treatment and determining prognosis. So staging is one of the factors, right? You should also refer to IPI. IPI includes staging actually, and flippy risk stratification. They both include uh, staging, okay? CT scans of the neck, chest, abdomen, as well as bilateral bone marrow aspirate and biopsy are necessary. And our staging system that I'll show you in the next slide, it has got four stages. The stages can also be appended by A or B designations. A designation means there are no systemic symptoms. And B designation means presence of B symptoms, uh, which are fever, night sweat, and weight loss over six months, uh, which means more than 10% of body weight are lost in the previous six months, okay? Then we have got certain subscripts that we use uh, when we uh, describe the stage of the cancers, okay? So L means lungs and H means liver, P means pleura, B is, is bone, M is bone marrow, uh, D is skin, and E is extra nodal. We have got an S as well, which means spleen, but spleen is a part of, uh, um, of the lymphoid tissues, all right? Okay, so here is stage one. And what you see in stage one is that, um, just a minute, please. Um, NHL is divided into stage one and stage one E, okay? So stage one cancer is found in one lymph node group. You see over here, it is supraclavicular, I guess. Yes, it is supraclavicular. So you have, you have uh, um, a lymph node or a couple of lymph nodes that are involved, okay? So that is stage one, just one group. 
and stage 1 e cancer is in one nearby area or organ which means it has extended beyond the lymph node okay it has gone through the capsule and it is involving the adjacent structures okay this is known as extra nodal spread of the lymph nodes then we have got stage two. Now notice that here it was only in one group and now it is in two groups of lymph nodes. Okay, these are perhaps axillary, high axillary or whatever. So stage two is divided into stage two and stage two E, just like stage one. Stage two cancer is found in two or more lymph nodes on the same side of the diaphragm. This is important, you know. You see two sides above the diaphragm or two sites below the diaphragm, this is the inguinal lymph nodes, both sides, okay? But they should either be above the diaphragm or below the diaphragm, okay? If they are on the both sides, one side is here and one side, um, I mean, one involvement is here and one involvement is here, then that goes to stage three. Now we have got uh, stage two E, which means uh, that the cancer has extended to uh, the adjacent region you see over here, a cancer is also found outside the lymph nodes in one nearby organ or area on the same side of the diaphragm. So you have one group over here, one group, and this one you see it has spread out of the lymph node, right? So this becomes 2E if it remains inside the lymph nodes and there are two groups involved and they are on the same side of the diaphragm, then it is stage two. Right, E is for extranodal. Now this is stage three. What you see over here is, that now both sides, one group over here above the diaphragm and one group of lymph nodes below the diaphragm. When it is on both sides of the diaphragm, it goes to stage three, okay? And stage three could be extra nodal. This one, it's going out of the lymph node. Spleen, it is there in the spleen, one lymph node group over here and below the diaphragm is spleen, okay? Uh, then both spleen and extra nodal could also be there. So this is stage three. So lymphoma is found on both sides of the diaphragm in lymph nodes or extra nodal tissue of spleen. All right, so when it is on both sides of the diaphragm, it becomes stage three. And this is stage four, you know, stage four means spread to a distant organ outside the lymphatic system, such as the spinal cord, lungs, liver, brain, bone, okay? So this is how it is, you know, here it has gone to the liver. Here you see that, Two lymph nodes are involved in, it is here in the lungs as well. Again, one lymph node group above, one below and in the lungs. Here it is in the lungs, it could go to the brain, it could go to the bone marrow, right? So this is distant metastasis 